Here's the thing. If you're successful with your product, I'm going to blow your mind. Someone's going to copy you. How are you doing? Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, founder and podcast producer at Max Podcasting. And you can email me at max at maxpodcasting.com to save time with your high quality podcast. This is episode 2,141. And today's guests, guests plural, are Chris Guerrera and Carmine Danisco. They are some of the brightest minds in the worlds of invention and manufacturing and product development. Carmine is the president of the United Inventors Association, and he's the founder of Earmark Sourcing, and he is an absolute wizard when it comes to inventing and creating products and getting them developed all around the world. Chris is known as the king of manufacturing, and he is a lean Six Sigma master black belt an amazing career as a mechanical engineer, and is also the VP of the United Inventors Association. In this episode, we talk all things how to invent a product, how to manufacture a product, whether or not you should get a patent, and when to do that, along with some of the best analogies you'll ever hear, and lots of talk about sexy cars and aspirations to coach professionally in the sports world. It is Chris, and it is Carmine. And you will certainly need to buckle your seatbelts and get your popcorn ready. That is a must. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with the dynamic duo of dynamic duos. Uh, In the world of dynamic inventions, we are here with Chris Guerrera and Carmine Danisco, not Nabisco, who are uh, some of the leaders of the United Inventors Association, just one of the brightest minds in the world of inventing and manufacturing that you'll come across. Chris and Carmine, how are you doing today? Thanks so much for joining. Doing great, man. Thank you. Yeah, doing good. Looking forward to this, uh, this interview. Thank you. Right, well, that was the best part, just like the intro line right there. So, I, you know, I'm just here to disappoint you for the rest of it. But no, really, really appreciate you making time today and fascinating to dive into, you know, both your backgrounds and what you do individually, as well as uh, together, uh, kind of a Batman and Robin type thing. You can you can choose who's who uh, or maybe you do both. But before that, I want, I want to start off with invention. So we'll start off with you, Carmine. Is there anything growing up that you can flash back to that you remember of like, oh, wow, that, this inventing thing is really, really cool. I might want to do this someday. Yeah, you know, there is. Uh, a lot of times as I was growing up or while I was growing up, I used to see my parents uh, struggling with things around the house, in the kitchen, and things in that sense. And uh, uh, I was the youngest of three. Not that that's a lot of children in the house, but I was always struggling for attention I don't know why, but I was. So I always used to try to figure out ways to help them out. So they would say, oh, thank you so much, or this is great. So it really started me on the way of inventing and helping others. I mean, I can barely count to three, so off to a hot start. But uh, how, how about you, Chris Chris slash Christopher? I'm tripped up on the name, which is so easy. Do you have any, uh, is there anything that made you, you know, jump out of your socks about inventing growing up? I tell you, it's interesting because I'm also the youngest of three. You know how it is when you're youngest. You always you always scrapping, whether you're playing sports or you're looking for homework or attention. It's just how it is, and I I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for anything because I think it made me who I am today from a personality trait. And I, I always found myself fascinated with with how things worked. You know, I'm an engineer, so obviously I I I, I would say back in uh, when I was 13, I went to a technical high school, and there's a lot of curriculums you can choose from. There's about 28. I picked design and, and engineering. And of course, my dad was an electrical guy. My brother was a paint body guy. And they're all like, why'd you pick that? It just naturally attracted me. So I found myself at an at, at, at early age, age 13, making a decision that lasted forever, a career decision. Think about that for a second. At age 13, I had the largest, from an entre- entrepreneurial standpoint, I had the largest paper uh, in Waterbury, Connecticut. So all my friends were always competitive and you know, we were, I had 150 customers, I think. It was like, you know, you do your schoolwork, running track, playing baseball, basketball, then you had to go do your paper. I always found myself intrigued. So I would say um, early age, young age, 
even before 13, messing with blocks and stuff outside and trying to build things with my hands. I always felt that that need. So I, I think it does start at an early age. Paper is, is something um, something my dad has always talked about as like one of the um, best early signs of entrepreneurship and like innovation. Like there's so many amazing entrepreneurs, super successful people out there that started with a, a paper route because I think there's so many lessons you can learn from it. Uh, what was the lesson, Chris, that sticks with you best to this day from uh, fr- from doing that paper route uh, business at the time? Yeah, it's it's responsibility. It's a commitment, right? So during the week, you're delivering papers early in the morning. So it's a commitment of getting up before you go to school. Most kids can't get up after school starts. I had to get up two hours before school started, right? And then the best one was on a Sunday. Because now you've got Sunday paper, which is 10 times thicker. So those 150 papers now are heavy, extremely heavy. You know, I'd, I'd even beg to get a ride every now and then for my dad. Please let me put them in the trunk. But most of the time, it didn't. you know, back in the day, it wasn't like that. So most of the time, you had to lug it on your shoulder and walk it around. And so the faster you did it, the lighter the bag got. So I always found responsibility and commitment to make sure that what you say you were going to do, you're delivered on. That... Sunday route, were you able to finish before the uh, Sunday NFL games? Oh, yeah, I was so young back then. I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I'm like today. I, like, I live, I, I plan my life around NFL today. <laughs> back then, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you two meet each other? Because, because I know that uh, you two are really tight and partner on a number of things now, but as of, you know, just a few years ago at the time of this recording, you, you hadn't even met yet. So, what, so how did, how did this bromance blossom? Uh, you know, several years ago, um, I was doing some, I was on the board for the UIA and I was doing some podcasts and some recordings uh, at the hardware show out in Vegas. You know, for some reason, Chris is one of those guys that when he walks in a room or walks by, you just want to say, hey, what's up or talk to him. And uh, he was walking by, he had a, a buddy with him that had an invention and I was doing a podcast and I grabbed him. And I said, hey, why don't you guys sit down? We'll do a, we'll do a show. And I didn't know who he was at the time. We got an intro. We started talking. And that was kind of the first, I think, Chris, um, meeting that we had, a, 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 unless there was some other time. No, that was it. And, and I, you know, I think you can tell when the chemistry is right with people, right? It's easy to see when someone's wanting to do the right thing and doing the right thing. And uh, I think we, then we joined, uh, Carmine was on the United Inventors Association board. Then they had asked me to join. I joined and, you know, we, we quickly made some changes and then we, became the president and the vice president, but I think our synergies are right. You know, he, he's got manufacturing and connections all over the world. I do a lot of uh, my manufacturing, mostly all my manufacturing in the U.S., so it's like a perfect match. Not everything is made for the U.S., and things that aren't made for the U.S., Carmine can do, and vice versa. And I think we have a, you know, a diversified enough background that the chemistry is, has been great, and, uh, and now we're helping a lot of people. And Carmine, what was your first impression of this guy chris who walks in the room and uh, won't stop talking <laughs> well that was my impression no it, uh, you know when i when i, when I first uh, met up with chris you know he, he super organized very professional nice guy you know people believe that chris is assertive or, or sometimes he is not i don't want to say pushy but he gets what he needs and gets it done and the reason he does that is because when he says he's going to do something he does it and that's kind of the first impression i got and i love that about people when they say they're going to do something they get it done and in this industry and in almost any industry you know that's something that we have to live by all we have is our word and that's one thing that really impressed me everything that chris has uh, said he was going to do he has come to fruition which is just awesome in this day and age you know, I, I would say, you know, that, that falls back and max on efficiencies, right? I come out of the automotive industry and there's no room for error. Like at Ford, BMW, especially BMW, you shut a line down, it's $1,100 a minute. You have 2,000 people standing around on one assembly line. You're not in, you're not in a job for, for too long if you're doing that. So for me, it's always been efficiencies and it's, it's about, you know, I hear a lot of people do a lot of talking and they do no delivering and that's an annoyance for me. I mean, you know, I, I, and Carmine knows that. So I, I'm, I'm a no-nonsense guy, and I like to deliver on what I promise. So let's deliver on some nonsense here. Let's, uh, let's get to uh, manufacturing for inventions. So as you alluded to, you, you both have kind of this 
yin yang of you know Chris with the background and USA manufacturing, Carmine with connections and in, in, in manufacturing prowess all around the world. Uh, so it works really well, well together. And obviously, entrepreneurs can go you know one of two routes or, or both of those routes with their businesses over over their lifetime. Chris, starting with you, <laughs> we joked before the interview that that I heard. Um, somebody call you to peanut butter and jelly. And you said, you said, that's great. But I, I prefer the nickname King of Manufacturing, which I, I guess probably has a little bit more weight to it. So where did this interest in manufacturing in the first place start with you? Yeah, so I, I started back out as an engineer, as I told you, and, I, and then I went into product development. And from product development led me to tool design, not just product design, application. Uh, so the whole gamut. And then truly, when I went to uh, BMW, I, I went in as a technical manager, then quickly got promoted to plant manager, then vice president, then executive vice president. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. So everything under that plant falls under me. And part of that was Lean Six Sigma. So throughout my career, I became a master black belt in Lean Six Sigma. People say, what the hell is that? It, it's the highest level you can have. It takes a lot of work to get to that level. Just to sum it up and make it simple, it's efficiencies. It's all about producing what you need when you need it, about changing tools out quick, making sure you don't have a lot of capital tied up and cash tied up in capital, and it's streamlining your process so you do it the first time the right way. It gets done quickly, and it's effective. You have good quality. It doesn't come back. And I become an expert in that area. I, I mean, everything I do now, I see through a different lens. So you read my mind there because I was I've heard so much about Six Sigma and, and even black belt term thrown around a few times, but I, I still don't really know what it is. But it helps when you characterize it in terms of efficiency. And I know it's got a super helpful on the engineering side for somebody to become a, a black belt in this space. How much um, studying slash courses slash whatever is involved is there to achieve that rank? Yeah, there's different levels, right? You start out early on as a yellow, green, and then it, it progresses red, black. And then levels of black, and then there's master black belt. You have to do a lot of, uh, actually a lot of facilitations of, of gimbas and Kaizans in work areas. You have to, with BMW, I had to do 20 different facilitations around the world. So I was actually doing Kaizans and events in France, in Paris, and in Germany. I was sitting in, in some of these classes where they spoke a different language. So, you know, so that, and that was part of the criteria. But then when you came back, you had, I don't know, 46 plants at the time, and you were compared amongst all the plants of your efficiencies. So what type of uptime you had on your machines, what type of throughput, how fast you can change tools over, how low your inventory was, how fast you turned your inventory, how good your cash flow was, how good your quality was. All these were key matrix and measurements that you're being evaluated on me personally in my plant, and I'm compared across the world on those platforms. And once a year, you have a this huge forum in Germany or in France, where all the executives meet, could be up to 500 people, and then you're ranked in front of everybody. And I, I can tell you, when I took the BMW plant, when I first started to run it, it was a mess. That group was losing about a million dollars a month, and I had made a commitment I can turn it around in a year. It took every act of God. When I, when I, and when I say this, it's like you come into work at 5 in the morning. You go through all your iterations. I didn't leave until 10. My phone would ring at 2 in the morning if the line went down. So it was a constant... I mean, that, that, that's what lean is, right? It's constant improvement all the time. Even when you become world-class, you got even more ways to improve. You have to continue to improve. And, and I think, you know, part of that drives me also, right? I'm also competitive. I don't like to lose. I like to be number one. If you're not used to that environment, it'll rip you apart. And that's why I say automotive is a good training ground for me because across the board, Ford Motor Company, all the big companies do that. And you're held accountable. You're responsible and held accountable. So I just found the best way to do it is to learn the systems really well, get the right people, train them, put them in the system, and then hold everybody accountable. And I'm telling you, I've done some wonderful things with it. And speaking of foreign language, can you define Gimba and Kaizen? Because I'm already learning all sorts of new terms. Yeah, Gimba is like the, a, a Kaizen is an event. If you do like a SMED, a single minute exchange die, you're actually going to look okay, at there you go. That, that one we got an instant definition on. <laughs> yeah, so you, you got, you're evaluating your tool changes over time. Right. So the goal is to make to not build inventory. So in order to do that, when you're doing injection molding, you have to have the machine, which is a big dollar item, a big capital item. You don't want it sitting idle. You want it running all the time. So how do you do that? You do the quickest tool changes possible 
You don't build big banks of inventory and tie cash up, especially maybe you run into risk of perhaps having a quality issue in, the, in that bank of material. So you, you do quick changes. You get mold changes in and out. You build low inventory and you, and you high throughput. Gimbals are like uh, the center where you're going to do it. Like if I want to do single minute exchange I smed, I'm going to do it in an injection molding area. And then we'll have a large Kaizen event to attack just that. So how do you do it? You have quick connect plates. You have uh, stably connectors that are all color coded. The molds are being heated on the outside of the injection press. So when you, when you go to put everything in, it's all process. You have a nice little workstation on wheels. That's like a surgeon's table with all your tools. You're not looking for tools. You're not looking for anything. It's like NASCAR. You stop the press, last good piece, change the mold. First good piece, that's your time. So Carmine, let's get to your Gimbas and Kaizen because those are two of my new favorite terms. Chris has the footprint, uh, literally in the U.S., and you kind of skew more on the global side of things. So, so what got you thinking more globally in terms of you know your connections and and ties in the manufacturing world? So yeah, it's um it's one of the one of the things that uh, I've been working on for close to twenty years. You know, I I started off as most inventors. Uh, I am an inventor and we're all crazy. I can say that because I am an inventor, you know, starting off wanting to make here in North America, in the U S and there are some products as Chris mentioned that, that really, you know, you can make here and, and make a good living at, but you know, what I found very quickly was I needed to be flexible. I need to be nimble. I needed to make those products at a good quality, at a good price. And sometimes it just was not feasible. Had to go to Guatemala, Honduras, the Philippines, Korea, China, India, things like that, and and really try to get that product at a good price. Uh, so what I did was I just started building up those relationships. Uh, I went through a lot of people. I called up uh, some of the colleges in the area, in the, in, the, in the U.S., found out who had the great MBA systems, the world classes, the, you know, the classes on international business. And I found some of the people who were taking classes here in the U.S., and then they were moving back to their countries. I made made them and started hiring them as a consultant and just build up that relationship so that when I did need a project done or a product developed, I could reach out to them and they were a trusted partner. And I still have many of those people that um, I work with today. So that's what kind of really drove me is because as Chris does here in the U.S., it's not just about having a product and it's not just about selling a product. It's a constant ability to lower that cost, to raise that quality, to deliver that product faster. So having those relationships and being on the same level, it just helps you do that. So that's constant. Uh, you know, we develop a product. The next question is a year later is, okay, how do we get the price down? And we can do that with our contacts overseas. Right now we're running, Chris and I, uh, we're running 50 products in seven different countries. And the reason we're doing that, most of those are either redevelopment, new versions, updated products or lowering costs overall. So it's not just about developing new products. It's about reinventing your product for a better price. So you mentioned seven different countries just over, you know, the past decade or two, are there certain countries or certain parts of the world where, uh, you, t who you tend to partner with more frequently? There are, you know, uh, we, we all want to shy away from, um, the Asian countries and we all want, but you know, it's one of those things where the people in these countries are awesome. You know, we might not agree with the government, how they work, how they do things. There are some countries you're going to stay away from. And I found that out. But a lot of the countries, so it depends on the product. So, you know, and I don't want to take up too much time, but, you know, having the ability to reach out to different countries with different technical abilities, that is what's most important. So you don't want to make a plastic product in Honduras right now. You don't want to make a plastic product in Guatemala. You might want to do clothing or products or sheets or, you know, they're known for those fabrics, but they are starting to learn. They are starting to develop those plastic injections as Chris made. So depending on your product, depending on the type of material you're going to make, you have to be able to reach out to those experts and do that. So a lot of products are plastic. A lot of products are injection molded. So you're going to go to those Asian countries, whether it's Korea or China, the Philippines and things like that. Of course, electronics, you really can't beat those guys. Now we can pay more somewhere else, but we're going to get beat on price. So you really have to sometimes put your um, ego aside and deliver a good price for a good product. I, I don't. This, my ego personally can't be put aside. <laughs> don't get me going on ego. But you don't want to hear my ego. <laughs> no, then we're really going to run out of time. <laughs> ego. No, but <laughs> so so I I would love to do almost like a thought experiment here, and, and for and for 
you know, this next series of questions, uh, Six Sigma question. No, I'm just kidding. This next series of questions, uh, either gonna, of you can gonna, jump I'm in I'm going to test you at the end of this, uh, this podcast. I, I've got no, I don't know how to spell Gimber or Kaizen, but <laughs> no I have it on my notes. I thought you were but, cursing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh no, I can't even spell my last name, but like if I am an inventor of a, a a physical product and I'm really, really excited about it. Um, I've, I kind of have like the initial prototype done, but I'm looking to, you know, get some backing. I'm looking to start scaling and actually start, you know, producing this product for real. Where, what are some good pointers for somebody in that situation to get rolling and start like thinking bigger with their product? Obviously, I look at it a little bit different, right? Being in the US, you have to be extremely competitive. So what are some of the ways I'm competitive to, to manufacture product in the US on an injection molded part? Well, for example, the tooling is built in the same plant. That tooling is then put in the, in the same equipment in the same plant. The molding is done in that same plant. The operator who's actually running the machine, the labor is already accounted for. So when that press closes, that's free time, free labor time. So you have labor. You don't want them walking around. You don't want them watching movies. You, you, you really want to make them efficient. So if there's value add to the product, like in the case of the product I took on Shark Tank, Super Potty Trainer, there's, a, there's silicone pads they put on. There's a label they put on. It goes right into a box onto a skid, and it has two locations. In the same plant, either goes into inventory or it literally goes to the dock to be shipped. So there's no trucking it. There's no shipping containers. There's no fulfillment centers. There's no touching it two and three and four and five times. There's no mishandling it. All of that cost is eliminated completely. So now the speed to shipping is incredibly fast and the cost is incredibly low. So that, that's, that's where I can be extremely competitive. So when I, I look at a new product, I look at all of that first. Then I say, okay, can I do that in my facilities? If I can, then we start quoting it. If I can't, then Carmine gets involved. And we start looking at uh, options and costs associated with those options to either produce it in the U.S. or not and give them an option to produce abroad. You know, a lot of us inventors... We believe if we have an idea and and some of us are taught, there's some books out there. There's some um, companies out there that lead us inventors or lead people down the road that if they have an idea, that's all they need. And they're going to make a lot of money that it's just somewhat easy to sell your idea or license your idea. Well, it's not. People don't buy ideas. They don't pay for ideas. So there's a specific sequence that you should follow. I'm not saying that you need to do everything and go and manufacture 10,000 units of your product, but you need to not only prove that your product is feasible, that it can be made and it can be marketed and that people want it. So you need to go through at least that sequence in order to be somewhat successful. So finding somebody, as you mentioned, an investor or signing somebody to buy it, they're not going to pay for a patent. If you just have a patent, most likely you're not going to get somebody to invest in your product because you haven't proven that it's wanted or feasible or marketable or that you can be made. So you have to answer that question. Why now? Why is this product you know, needed in the market? So if I get involved or Chris gets involved, we're going to step you through those processes. And it's not free, but you need to do it in a smartly manner. You know, we get here at the UAA tons of calls, tons of heartbreaking stories that people have spent their money with the company or they've you know, spent it in the wrong direction or at a sequence. You know, we get people that have spent $50,000 on patents. Now, we're not against patents, but there's a sequence. There's a time to do it. So... When we get involved, we really have to step back. We have to look at the product, see where the people are, what they want to achieve, and then we go from there. And, and that's what Chris and I work very well at. No matter what that next step is, we had the answer. Some of the people are teaching the wrong thing to these inventors, and they're taking their money, but they're, but they're teaching them wrong. I had somebody come to me not too long ago with a yellow sticky, literally with some hand-drawn sketch, and they, they, they reached out to me. I said, well, how can I help you? They said, well, I want to know how fast you can get that into Walmart. So I I, I literally thought I was being punked. I said, what do you mean? You you mean that that yellow sticky, the the sketch? I said, you realize Walmart buys finished products and finished retail packaging, right? There's barcodes, it's in packaging. There's a distribution center. There's trucking companies involved. There's purchase orders with buyers. They don't buy ideas. And they were like shocked. So that again, some of these people are being taught incorrectly. And some of these companies are, having people coach people who have never done the process. 
who have no success stories. So how can you teach them? That's like me saying, I'm going to just show up at the Yankees next week and become their manager. I, I coach high school. I coach Little League. You know, I coach AAU. So I can coach pro, right? <laughs> That's- well, there's there's some fans out there that probably would uh, welcome you as manager. Well, I can tell you the Vikings. I'm sure. You know what's funny, Max? The if, if there's anyone that's going to be pulled out of the out of the stands to coach, it would be Chris. He would just show up to a spring season training, and for somehow they would grab him and ha- and say, "Hey, we need a coach." You know, and and yeah, that would be I, I just want one chance of being a defensive coordinator for one game for the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> I promise you, I will fix that defense. <laughs> I I will not mention right now that. Uh, my wife is a big Giants fan. I oh, definitely no. Bring My that up. family are Giants fans. <laughs> All right. First and foremost, I have to apologize, uh, Chris, to coming to you with that post-it note. I, I should have developed the product more before <laughs> I asked you for it. <laughs> but, uh, no, this, this, this is really great insight. And, uh, Carmine, you, you brought up a patent, which I think is something that so many inventors struggle with. There's like a group of people that want to get a patent as soon as possible. And there's others that are like, uh, actually it kind of reveals all your secrets when you do that. So like, what, what would you say is the right time to actually get your product, uh, a patent for what you're making? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's, there's several steps in the sequence. So the first thing you would do is if you needed to get a patent, uh, if you are obligated to be a patent. So, um, if you're going to go on HSN or QVC, or you're going to get that product and put it out into the public. You don't need to get a full patent. You get a provisional patent. It's called a PPA. You get a year on your product. There's a lot of products out there that are so moving so fast that there's so many changes in it and so many versions that even if you're patenting, there's no reason to because there's changes. You're always going to be ahead of those knockoffs. Here's the thing. If you're successful with your product, I'm going to blow your mind. Someone's going to copy you, okay? I'm telling you right now. So you're not going to – because you're thinking about the U.S., you still got the rest of the world. So even if you had a patent here in the U.S. and, I, and you're making a million dollars on your product, I'm just going to go sell it in Europe. So don't put all your trust in a patent system. We work with the U.S. PTO. We are friends with them. We, we work very, very closely with them. So the answer being is to get a patent is when it's stopping you from making money, not out of fear, but out of true business knowledge. If you need that patent to make money, to sell your product, that's when you apply for your patent. It has to be a reason for it. And you don't ask your patent attorney for business advice. They are a patent attorney. If I go to the dentist and tell him my foot hurts, he's going to work on my teeth. So if you need information on your invention, if you need direction, ask somebody who knows. And here's the trick. Ask them how many products they have invented that have been successful. So if you're going to take advice, take it from somebody that actually does it. Most likely, they're going to say none. I'm loving all these analogies here and a, a dentist combo with the foot doctor, I think would be pretty impressive. That, that's a lot of schooling there. Oh, yeah. Mac, you know what happens if you, if you spend your money foolishly or in the wrong places out of sequence, then when you need the money for the right sequence, you don't have it anymore. Then the favor, the famous line I always get was, it would be, Oh, Hey, I'll give you a percent of my company <laughs> if you can help me. So I say, okay, let me make sure I understand. So you want me to put all my cash into it, invest into your product, spend the next one to two years developing it, and you're going to give me a percent of your company that's worth zero right now. So I'm not sure I understand. So you want me to spend all my money on your product, investing in your product with the chances and hope that it'll be more than zero percent. That's Somehow it just doesn't make a whole lot of mathematical sense. It doesn't. My head is spinning now. I need a calculator. I need... Uh, you know, there's a lot of zeros there. I'm sure it falls back to some type of Lean Six Sigma diet. You need a Six Sigma black belt, Max. That's what you need. <laughs> I know, exactly. I got one. I, I can try it out for you. I got you one. You're right next to me. <laughs> Perfect. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it on a uh, a sticky note. I'll, I'll, I'll draw one. That'll that'll be the start. <laughs> what are some of the, some other of the most common challenges that you see that 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 each of you see uh, new inventors and entrepreneurs run into on the manufacturing side? It's just um, a lot of times, Max, what we see is they're getting information, as we mentioned earlier, they're getting information from the wrong sources. Uh, They're moving forward too quickly at the wrong time, spending money out of sequence on the wrong things. And and that's one thing that we do very well, Chris and I, is we put resources. You got to remember, money is a resource, but there's other resources. It's spending time away from your family. It's calling that family friend for an investment money. It's telling the neighbors about your product. If you use all of your resources in the wrong place, when you're ready and need those resources, they're not available. 
So one of the problems that we see a lot of is that inventors, you know, they are using the wrong resources. They're listening to the wrong person. You don't even ask your neighbor, hey, I got this idea. What should I do next? The neighbor's going to say, get a patent. And you're going to say, okay. So, so that is the biggest thing that we see. And they have, they have absolutes. If you ask an inventor, hey, who's this product for? They say everyone. Well, if you say everyone, that means no one. So if you tell an investor, this product's for everyone, he knows you didn't do your research. Even an iPhone isn't for everyone. So it's those things that you have to be truthful with yourself. You have to know your market and you got to know what the limitations of what you can do and bring in the right people to take over those gaps and fill in those sequences when it's needed. So the best one is a study that says, oh yeah, hey, my family thinks it's great. All my friends, I've shown it to all the people at the baseball field, they love it. They think it's great. I go, okay, good, super. Um, have them write you a check. If they think it's that good, then have them invest in it right now. Because when someone gives me a stock tip and it's really good, I invest in it. Oh, they don't have any money. They don't want to, well, then it's not that good. So I always say, get away from your friends and family. Like that, that's too biased. Get some real surveys, some people you don't know that are, like Carmine says, like me, who's going to really tell you the truth and be forthright about it and tell you how I see it. I mean, you know, I, I can tell you how many people want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on inventory coming from China or doing something just because they told them this is the best line. They told me I should buy, I should make 10,000 units because the more units I make, the cheaper the piece price is. I'm like, okay, so what's your plan to sell it? <laughs> I don't have a plan. So you just spend your life savings and you have inventory now that you can't sell. No wonder why your wife wants to kill you. <laughs> Yeah, you somehow stumbled back to like this question I wrote down. It was probably 15 minutes ago, which was how do you, how do you advise inventors to think about their initial batch size? Yeah, so again, I, I'm I'm an inventory control guy. I don't like inventory, right? So inventory is evil, especially in early product development. <laughs> so, so batch size of one or zero. Yeah, well, 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 think about it, right? Let, let's just take a paycheck. Let's say somebody's working for a living and they get paid every week. So I tell them to take their paycheck and just put it on the shelf. Now, next week, just put it on the shelf. No, you can't touch it. Just look at it. Walk by it every day. Do it for like six weeks. Just keep doing it. That's what inventory is if you're not able to sell it. It's money. It's cash that you've tied up that you hope someday you can sell. But if you don't, then you're done. It's a little different than having a poor quality product where you, you, know, you have to either rework it, which costs you more, or you have to scrap it, which is completely wasting cash. But that's how I look at inventory. So I always look at it where... It's really important that you take the right steps. There's no need to rush. Once you finally believe you have something right, you have the, you know, you have the design, your packaging, and you're ready to go full blown, then you hit the market running. But there's, there's a sequence in how you should do it. And there's a sequence for signing up for the Podcasting to the Max newsletter. Thank you so much, Chris. Your check is in the mail. You can sign up by going to maxpodcasting.com slash newsletter. Uh, enter in your email, and then you will get an email from me every Thursday that includes podcasting tips, it includes entrepreneurship tips, and it includes some awful puns that you could just like ignore that part if you don't like awful puns. But if you do, this is the newsletter for you, as well as you know the sprinkles of entrepreneurship in, in podcasting as well. Sign up at maxpodcasting.com slash newsletter. Now, let's dive into the best way to invent products. And just a note for the rest of the interview, Carmine had to hop off probably to go fight with somebody about a patent. So he is in this next segment, but for the remaining two segments after that, it will just be Chris and I. So if you're wondering where in the world is Carmine San Diego, just kidding, Carmine Tonesco, that is where. So let's switch gears and tooling and injection molding and uh, machinery a little bit. And let's get to uh, a segment on inspiration and creativity. So this is can involve some of the stuff. Uh, it's actually going to be a mix of, you know, your work and then kind of non-work life. So for Michi, you're really curious. You've both, you know, invented things. You've been surrounded by endless <laughs> amounts of inventors and you both lead, you know, uh, an amazing organization and group of inventors. What are some of the best ways to come up with new product ideas? The main thing is, is to stay in your zone. Um, try to think of ideas that are within what you, maybe you do for a living. That certainly helps. So if you are frustrated with something or if you're seeing something that happens or 
somebody in your family, try to do that. The other is what I get a lot of inspiration and a lot of ideas is when I exercise, I could be on a bike ride, I could be at the gym, I could be doing something where my mind is being stressed and things like that. And for some reason, I come up with some great ideas or come up with fixes. Now, inventors and people are listening to me, that doesn't mean that they're all home runs. I have a book full and a closet full of ideas because I can make them that were duds. So even us, Chris and I both have come up with ideas that, you know, hey, they aren't for everyone or they aren't for the market. But that's how I come up with ideas a lot of times is I look at issues, I look at problems. The, as Chris mentioned, the easiest way to fix something is the nice lowest cost. You don't want it to be a $500 fix for a $20 vacuum, okay? So it, it, nobody's buying it. So just think about that when you come up with your ideas. Is it feasible? Is it worthwhile? Is it marketable? And uh, and then you'll cross that idea off or you'll move forward with it. You know, I, I like simple ideas, like small ideas, easy to sell, easy to handle, easy to ship, easy to put on shelves. How many times have you heard someone say, oh man, they need to fix this. They need to come up with a better idea. Well, come up with it. Don't say they need, who's they? That's what I used to say. Who's they? You have somebody you know that's going to fix this? Or why don't you just say, what do you think it needs? So maybe that's part of the engineering and that's maybe part of how I brought up. I've, I've designed and, and launched thousands of products throughout my career and in corporate and my, on my own. But I, I always say, like, who's they? Like you, you do it. You come up with the idea. Stop talking about it. I hear a lot of people talk about ideas. If you don't take action, it's all it's ever going to be is an idea. And I promise you, somebody else will come up with it. When you do come up with ideas, like ones that actually you get pumped about and they're, you know, small, simple, low cost, like all the kind of initial things that hit the criteria. What what are your initial next steps? Like where do, where do you like write it down or like put some, you know, permanence into this? I think you got to prove the concept, right, Carmine? That's a, that's what I always say. I don't care how you do it, but at some point you got to you got to prove out the concept that it's really solving the problem. Yeah, I agree. So so what we usually try to do here is that someone who comes into our office that just thought of an idea, we always ask them to wait a little while, wait a week or two. Uh, hey, listen, I love making money, but we also want the product to be successful. So we ask them to wait a little while, think about it. And then secondly, they should do a little bit of research. But here's the trick about that is that you can't, as the idea person, do the research because you're not going to find something that's like your product because you really don't want to. So find someone else to search for your product idea for what your product's going to do. Here at the office, we actually pay kids or high school kids to find stuff, not to not find things. So if we say, hey, we got this product coming in, see what's out there. And we, we will pay them to find something that's like it when we pay them anyway. But uh, but the thing about it is, is we want them to find things. And it's OK to have a products out there that are like your idea. You are just going to build a better mousetrap, a different color. Yours is going to be round. There's a square. Uh, if everyone only had one product, we'd only have one bicycle, one car, one phone. So it's OK to have a product that's out there. You don't have to be first. As Chris knows, it's expensive to be first. I think that's brilliant to have somebody else do the research and somebody else almost be like the devil's advocate because you're right. I mean, with so many things in life, there's confirmation bias with invention. It's I'm coining this invention bias where like <laughs> you have this idea, like you instantly get romantic about it and you, you so want it to like become a, a, a real thing and, you know, change your life and so many lives around you that it's like very easy to, ignore um some pretty you know fatal flaws early on so i i, I really love those approach the people who are like what i call patent freaks they, they want to patent in every country i'm like you haven't sold anything in the u.s why do you want to patent in china and england and indonesia you you haven't sold anything in the u.s were you gonna hang them on your wall they look terrific on your wall let's see that one's fifteen thousand. that one was seven that one was 20 how much how much how many products did you sell oh nothing yet okay like what's the point like you can even launch products without a patent because you know somebody at some point is going to try to rip you off. If you do the work, it's a good product, you're going to get cologne. Someone's going to take it from you. Then I always say, even if you have a patent, how are you going to defend it? You're willing to defend it? Right. Do you have the cash to defend it? Because if a big company like 3M decides that they want to swoop in on you and you're just a little guy who, has a, who had a great idea that now has a product and they want to take it from you and you have a patent, that's great. But how are you going to defend it? I, I'm just imagining like thousands of patents as, as wallpaper. It's, it's a bit of a non-traditional approach, but it's a great visual. How about outside of work? So Carmine, you mentioned exercise. 
uh, you know, either of you, what what are uh, you know besides trying to uh, take over the job as manager for the Yankees, what what are some hobbies or <laughs> what do you like? Well, to do My newest one is the Minnesota Vikings defensive coordinator. Okay? <laughs> That's <laughs> true. That. Okay, but besides any vacant or already taken coaching <laughs> positions, what, what what do you like to do outside of work? <laughs> I'm a car fanatic. I love cars. I've had Porsches, M6s, uh, Range Rovers. I just love cars. I'm trying to, I'm looking at buying a new M8 right now. My wife's like, do you really need another car? Nice. Nice. I, I, here's how I visualize it. When I told you I was 13, maybe I was 10 at this point. I'm, I don't, and you might be too young for this, Max. The Tyco and Aurora racetracks. I had all those racetracks. I had all the fancy cars. And then I grew up and actually bought those cars as a kid. I had that mindset that someday I'm going to actually drive those cars. I loved them so much. Then I grew up and bought them. <laughs> you talk about a waste of money, but it was fun. I had a lot of fun with them. <laughs> and, I, and the sad <laughs> part, though, I lived in New Hampshire, so I couldn't drive them in the winter. And now I live in South Carolina. I can drive them in the winter. I don't have them anymore. <laughs> it's like grass is always greener. It, it, it doesn't line up. <laughs> but uh, that's amazing. Those those do sound familiar. I'll have to look them up after this. But uh, h- how about you, Carmine? How about in addition to exercise? What what, what else do you do to kind of keep your mind fresh? And uh, So, um, you know, I live in Tampa, uh, just outside of Tampa, Florida, Clearwater, Florida. So we go to the beach, have a family. We go do things on the weekends. I, I love what I do. Uh, my wife loves what she does. So it's hard for us to get away from work because we have fun at work. Uh, We kind of work together. Our buildings are connected, which is really cool. But, uh, you know, I'm like Chris. I think that a lot of us inventors are doing things with our hands, even if, you know, we're relaxing. I work on cars. I do things around the house. I get out. I do go bike riding a lot. We do some long distance stuff. So, yeah, I just uh, just relax and get away from work. But in in my line of work and same with Chris is uh, we're always kind of working just because we, we love what we do. So speaking of loving what you do, uh, let's get to uh, the unusual because I absolutely love hearing the aspects of you know entrepreneurs like yourself's personality, pet peeves, quirks, weird talents. What, <laughs> and I can imagine there can be some based on <laughs> the jokes that we've had so far, but what, what what's your biggest pet peeve? Just something random that grinds your gears. It's commitment, right? It's back to like, if you say you're going to do something, just d- do it. Don't come up with all the excuses why you didn't do it. Because the excuse part is easy. You can make those up all day. But to really follow through and finish up what you promised to deliver on, that takes a little bit more work, especially when things don't go that smooth. So that that's kind of a pet peeve. Another pet peeve is when, when someone contacts me and they're asking me a million questions about my background. So my first question is, I, I mean, we're, we're not even doing business yet. And I'm like, didn't you look me up? How did you find me? Did you check? Just search my name. Just type my name in and all the questions you're asking me will come up. <laughs> so it's like, do some research. <laughs> it, it, exactly. Mr. Cameron Guerrero, that's exactly right. All right. So what about quirks? What's something a little bit quirky about your personality? But it's who you are. People love it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think because I'm always on time. I make a big deal about being on time and some people... You know, like I talk about efficient, I'll give you two of them. I talk about efficiencies and being on time. Like to me, if you're on time, you're already late. So running a big company like BMW, you have in a conference room at any moment, you have over a million dollars of salary. So if somebody comes strolling in five or 10 minutes late and they miss the beginning of the meeting, first of all, to me, extremely disrespectful to the rest of the group. And there's no way, why should anybody start over a meeting for something you missed? So we used to have like these rules in place. You get one free freebie, but it better be a good reason. The second one, don't show up. Third one, you, you're fired. And, and once you start setting those tones, again, you're in a, you're in a serious manufacturing operation, high-level people, building BMWs. You, you don't have time for that. That's something you do in high school. So that, that's always been a pet peeve of mine. So being punctual you know, and, and being, being ready to go before you're ready to go. And, and I think like, delivering, I, I'll give you another a funny, this is a kind of a cute, uh, example, I had my 21 year old son with me and we're hanging out, I think one day and I said, Hey, Tyler, what do you think? Um, so this is what, four years ago? Yeah. Cause he's 20, he'll be 25 next month. So four years ago. And it was December right before COVID. I said, hey, what do you think about me uh, proposing live on good morning America to Brandy? And he's like, yeah, right. Sure. Like he didn't like, didn't, didn't like zero. Like he's seen me on good morning. America, seen me on shark. Tank, seen me all these, and he didn't think it could happen. And I'm like, Okay, I'm gonna. I'll let you know. I, I I sent a text to the producer, and I I literally got a response in ten seconds. 
doesn't always happen like that. It just happens to be I caught her at the right time. She said, um, I don't know if I can get you on live. She said, but I'll definitely get you on. We'll film it. And then uh, as we get a little closer, we'll plan it out. I, within a minute, I had VIP passes. So now, so now Tyler's like, what? So then fast forward months in advance, we're, 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 uh, we're getting ready to go. I'm, I'm getting calls at three in the morning. And everyone's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm working. So they're trying to plan how they want to do it. It's not live yet. So then I get a call at about 5.30 in the morning, just before we're leaving. And they said, everything I just told you, scratch. We are going to go live. I'm not sure when yet. It'll probably be after 8 o'clock. I'm going to hand you a mic. You're going to get two minutes. Bring the ring and don't F it up. That's what we said. <laughs> so then, then, I, you know, then I'm in the studio and I'm, and I'm, I'm not really ready, right? I'm, I'm still like, Brandy's like, Brandy thinks she has no idea. Like I kept this. I didn't tell anybody but my son. She had no idea. And I, I'm in the studio trying to play it out how I want to do this because I want to talk about they want me to talk about GM a little bit. I know Robin Roberts, then they roll it in, into uh, into the proposal. So she, and she thought I was doing a pitch on a product. So I've been on a Good Morning America and a Shark Tank Good Morning America version where I did my product pitches. So if any eventually we we do it, it's over. It goes really well, extremely well. Producer comes out and says, "Hey, did she say yes?" I'm like, I, "Brandy's like, of course I said yes." Then he goes, <laughs> "Did she swear?" And I'm like, I don't know, man. You're giving me the whole 30 seconds, 20 seconds. Tyler goes, yep. <laughs> so <laughs> come to find out, I shocked her so much. And she wasn't mic'd. I was the only one mic She said, uh, no effing way. Like she was like in disbelief. So in the back room, they're trying to stop her from going across the wave lines, right? They're trying to edit it and take it out. It just the whole thing was funny. And, and I think what, what the life lesson was there, that Tyler saw something that looked impossible. And at the end, you know, he was talking to Michael Strahan and Robin Roberts, and he was in an element he had never been in before. And it was a pretty cool experience for me being his dad. Oh, my God. That's amazing. What, what was going through your mind when the first word out of her mouth was technically no? I, you know, I, I didn't really even listen. Like, 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 you know, I was so like, like when you're doing that, you're up. Yeah. There's like steps and you got to be careful you don't fall off. They got a camera on you. You're holding the mic. My, my, the ring is in my pocket. Matter of fact, at one point I went to give Tyler the mic and he was backing away from it. So I, I needed to pull the ring out. And Tyler's like, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm not talking. He, he thought I wanted to give him the mic to start talking. I go, no, I need to get the ring out. So I didn't hear any of that. And it was low enough. Like, I think Tyler, I, I don't think anybody heard it, but maybe Tyler, you know, the mics pick up everything. And it was just kind of ironic. Even when they filmed it and they played it back, can't hear it. And then Robin Roberts did a follow-up. They brought Good Morning America to the house. And they did a follow up about six months later at our house. And, and it was pretty cool. Pretty cool experience. Yeah, that, that is unbelievable. And, and then how about uh, weird talents or, or party tricks? What's something that you're really good at? But it, it, uh, I used to be really good at funneling beer. I used to hold some oh, records. Now that is a party trick. <laughs> hey, right? We'd get a, uh, <laughs> a, a leader, cut it in half. Right? We, made our, we, we didn't buy any of that stuff in my, in my day. We made our own. An inch, a tube. Onto the onto the bottle, two feet long. We pour six beers in, and then time ourselves. Who can guzzle the best? So I got that award. <laughs> Perfect. I, I'm sure I can't do that now, but <laughs> <laughs> the the best beer drinking advice that's ever been on this podcast. No. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's uh, suds our way to uh, wrap up with some rapid fire Q and A. You ready for it? I'm ready. All right, let's get wild. <laughs> gonna crack open a beer. Uh, what, what is your dream car of dream cars of all dream cars? Oh, it's always been a Ferrari, F8. Always. And, and every now and then, I'm ready to buy one, and I say, I just can't do it. I'd rather buy another house or a piece of property. I've had all the cars, right? We talked about that earlier. I've had the M4. I've had a 650 convertible, an M6. I've had uh, MLs and X5s and Porsches, 911s. So I haven't had a Ferrari, but I that's. I guess if everything lined up right, that would be the car. I like it. No hesitation. And then what, you know, you've lived in New Hampshire, you've lived in, you know, now you're living in South Carolina, just a little bit different, both East coast ish though. Uh, what, what's, what's been the biggest change in, in living in the, uh, from what, where it gets super cold to uh, South Carolina? Yeah. I'd say, I'd say it's not like, you know, when you live up in, and the North is changing, it's not like it used to be right. It used to be a lot of snow. When I was a kid, really cold. 
and, and it's lightening up. But but what you, what I don't miss is just that. I don't miss having to clean off my car, shovel. The best way to describe it, I used to coach football, and you know everyone loves September. It's football season. But for me, it was like I love football. But then I know right around the corner is going to be the nasty, cold, snowy, windy, hellacious weather. I don't have to deal with that now in the South. I literally don't have to deal with any of that. Like there's no snow. Although we did have snow last year, I mean, five inches, of course, right? Because I'm down here now. But typically, it's pretty warm. It's not that heavy struggle of dealing with, because, you know, at three months of dealing with cold weather and snow, you're done by the third month. You've had enough, man. Like, And then you don't really get springs down here. You truly get a spring. You truly get a fall. So I don't miss any of that up north. Yeah, I, I've always thought that, like, I, I, I enjoy experiencing the different seasons at least for a little bit uh but like winter i, w- I could do probably like one day of snow and cold and then like all, all right let's bring on late spring <laughs> hey, i mean it, it got pretty cold here this christmas I, I was i happened to be in minnesota i went to the vikings giants game on christmas eve i mean that, to, to talk about that for a second right so it was my birthday it was a whiteout uh jefferson broke a record vikings kicked the longest field goal ever at the end to win it Talk about an amazing time. Like, I, I have a memory that will last forever. I, I've been to the Super Bowl, and that game in person was probably better than the Super Bowl game I went to, which was the, the oh, Rams wow. and the, the Patriots, and I think it was 2018. It was just – and it was minus 38 outside. Wouldn't show minus 38. It makes you thankful that the uh, <laughs> they built a dome for the Vikings. Well, they had a dome, but I mean – Yeah, but they, they also have what they call these uh, walk – the Skywalkers, which yeah, 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 I've heard of that. Yeah. Get you out of the element, but you still got to get to them. I'm telling you, I, if someone asked me to describe what does minus 38 feel like, I, I can only tell them that your face is going to fall off. Literally, that's. I, mean, <laughs> I was out. We were trying to walk around a little bit for 10, 15 minutes. You just can't do it. It's that cold. How about on the coaching side? So you've coached football, you've coached uh, all sorts of different ages of baseball. Uh, what is your best advice for anybody who wants to get into coaching out there? Uh, first of all, your kid's not always the best. That's the first thing I would say. Everyone thinks their kid's the best. I, mean, I know, a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, it should be the, I mean, you got to be honest because, I mean, if you're not careful, somebody can get hurt. Then I always say, like I used to tell all the parents, I keep score. So I'm actually trying to win. I'm going to teach your kids how to play and how to be better athletes and and really grow into, uh, you know, a, a good human. But as long as we keep score, I'm trying to win. And that's a life lesson. I mean, it really is. And structure is really important, especially in football. I mean, structure is really important. And I'll give you a, a fun story on, on a baseball. I coached, uh, I think this was 10, 11 year olds, 10, 11, 12 year olds. I had this kid probably, you know, you, you have, you know, your good players, right? You, you know who the kids are that are good. And then the other ones that are learning. I had a kid who was pretty much learning, showed up every single night for practice. He gave it 110% every single night. And I'll never forget, I mean, a couple of these stories like this, but I'll never forget this one. He comes up. I think in the beginning, we were probably near the bottom as far as our draft went of where they picked us to finish. And now we're in the championship game. So again, it shows you about showing up, structure, teaching. This kid comes to the plate. He's up uh, with a winning run on third. And he's literally shaking. So I call a timeout. I call him over. He goes, what's the matter? So he looked nervous. He goes, I'm, I, I'm not sure I can even swing the bat. I'm so scared. I said, why? So I just kind of tried to calm him down. I said, you have been nothing but amazing all year long. You've been a great kid. You showed up every practice. You know how to hit. You know how to catch. This is no different. Just, just forget everything. He's going to throw you a pitch. You're going to see it, and you're going to hit it, and we're going to win. It's that simple. So, like, you can see the confidence. He gets up. He gets a base hit. We win the game. And after that game, his mother came up to me and she's bawling her eyes out, like crying. I never had anybody teach my kid like this. I can't believe this. I never would expect it. This, the kid's crying. Like I'm starting to get choked up. And I said, listen, ma'am, you brought him every single night to practice. It's not me. It's your kid. It's you. You took that pride in taking him to practice every night. He was an absolute joy to coach. And here he gets the game winning hit. So you know what that turns out in, in the future? That builds confidence. Now his school grades go up. He feels better about himself. And to me, that's what's rewarding for me. That happened probably 30 years ago, that story. But it still sticks with me like it was yesterday. 
what a rewarding note to end on a game winning note to end on i'm gonna hit the batting cages right after this has been too long but <laughs> chris thank you so much this has been amazing just absolutely love uh all you do and your stories and jokes everything in between and really appreciate uh carmine and and all, everything you guys do as well thanks again for coming on and uh, where's the best place for people to um learn more about the uh, united inventors association the uia you can go to the website it's uiausa.org org and then you'll see our profiles and all we do for me it's chrisguerrera.com it's my name christopher or guerrera or chris guerrera you can google me you'll see i've been on shark tank on good morning america i've been on shark tank season 12 finale so i, I i'm not hard to find and um, i'm happy to to help anybody that that uh, is willing to put the time in. I'm, I'm glad to, to be part of all that. And and you'll see uh, coming up, we're at some bit, we handle a lot of the big shows, the inventor corners, and we put on a lot of education. We have a lot of Shark Tank people there, live pitch panels. Um, and we just bring, for example, the, the National Harbor Show, we have over 75 speakers on two stages just for that show. So we, we, we really uh, have a good network and a lot of good people who want to help. Amazing. Thank you so much. Last thing, final thoughts, uh, stage is yours, uh, like it is often. Final thoughts. It could be a quote. It could be a line, kind of uh, almost a Yogi Bear quote, whatever. Words to live by. Send us home here. So if you have an idea, act on it. Because it's just an idea until you literally act on it. I hear a lot of people talk about a lot of different things. And, you know, you go back to pet peeves, act on it. Because you never know. I mean, like it's like buying a stock. If you're afraid to buy it, then don't bother buying stocks. You have to take a risk because without the risk, there's no, there really is no reward. No risk, no reward. Uh, but if there's a Chris, there's a Carmine. Thank you so much, Chris and Carmine, for coming on the podcast, sharing your incredible inventing and manufacturing and engineering and cars and sports tips. You heard Chris's information. He's also on LinkedIn and Carmine you can find on LinkedIn as well, as well as earmarksourcing.com that's e-a-r-m-a-r-k sourcing.com thank you wild listeners for tuning in to another wild episode if you want to hear more wild <laughs> i'm going crazy with the wilds if you want to hear more wild stories like this one make sure to follow the wild business growth podcast on your favorite app and tell a friend about the podcast and then Listen again to the analogies from Carmine and Chris and uh, appreciate the alliteration with both of their names. You can also find us on Good Pods where they're very good podcasts. And for any help with podcast production, you can learn more at maxpodcasting.com and sign up for the Podcasting to the Max newsletter that is at maxpodcasting.com slash newsletter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos!